Thank you so much. Lovely to see you all this evening. Um, it's great to be here with you. And um, tonight we're going to be asking the question about how do you deal with doubt? How do you deal with doubt in difficult situations? How do you deal with doubt when disappointments overwhelm you? Uh, as a clergy person here, we typically build up towards the big festivals like Christmas and Easter, and then all the clergy need some time to recuperate. And so Easter Monday is typically the time when you go away. It always seems to be the case that when it's time for you to go away for that recovery break, there are roadworks on the M25, or, or there is traffic all the way down the M4 to the southwest, or if you're flying somewhere, there's something wrong with the planes. Now, it just so happened that on, uh, on Easter Sunday this year, there was an incredible storm. I don't know why, but every time you name a storm, it seems to get angry, as if it doesn't like the name it's been given. You are Storm Katie. Oh, suddenly it's Hurricane Velocity 10. So I'm watching the weather over the evening, thinking, oh my goodness, we're flying tomorrow morning. Are we actually going to be able to fly? And I've got one of those apps on my phone to kind of tell you whether you're on schedule or not. So to wake up my children on Bank Holiday Monday at 4 a.m. to get to Gatwick on time. And I got them out of bed and I checked the app and we got in the car and they fell asleep. And we drove down the motorway and we parked the car and we got to the airport. And I said to the guy at the check-in, you know, are our flights cancelled? Kind of half expecting them to be. And he said, no, no, your flight is fine. I was like, great, this is amazing. Praise God, I'm a great Christian traveller. This is brilliant. <laughs> this is going so well. Then we went through passport control, feeling pretty breezy, you know, got the baggage in, and, and then had a ridiculously expensive breakfast that wasn't very nice. Um, hung around a bit, mused around the shops, but didn't buy anything. And then we went early to gate, you know, a little bit anxious. And my daughter saying, Dad, is everything okay? Oh, yes, everything's fine. We are going on holiday. It wasn't until we actually got to the gate and I looked around for a plane that I began to doubt that we were going to fly anywhere. <laughs> Suddenly, doubt became a feature on my emotional radar. Doubt. It's tough, isn't it? We can doubt many things. Practical stuff, like our health or our finances or our circumstances. Emotional stuff like our relationships, our perceptions, or even our self-image, or spiritual stuff, like the existence of God, or whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. Let's have a look at our passage tonight, John chapter 20, verses 24 to 28. It says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Thomas has been unfairly labelled the doubter for 2,000 years. His little cartoon, I thought, was rather amusing. Thomas says, all I'm saying is that we don't call Peter denying Peter or Mark ran away naked Mark. <laughs> so why should I be saddled with this title? I see what your point is, Thomas, but really it's time to move on. <laughs> Maybe it is time to move on uh, from doubt. But I want you all to know that actually doubt isn't such a big problem. Thomas was not known as the doubter in the first century. He was known as Didymus, which means the twin. Scholars suggest that he might have been uh, Matthew's twin. And this helps us more because faith and doubt really are twins. Lots of Christians get in a bit of a pickle about doubt and they say, oh, I feel really bad because I feel like I should believe this more or I feel bad because I'm having a few doubts about one thing or another to do with my faith. But true faith is impossible to attain without some doubt. Paul Tillich says doubt isn't the opposite of faith, it's an element of faith. 
So if you're having a few doubts, if you go back to a few questions and, and wrestle a bit with doubts that you're having, it doesn't mean that your faith is weak. It means that your faith is real. What could be more natural than to doubt that a man that you'd seen brutally killed on a cross and buried in a tomb had suddenly come back to life again and was walking around talking to people? What would be unnatural about doubting that? You see, Thomas wasn't an unnatural doubter. He was just like you or me. So we're traveling with a low-cost airline. And initially, I believe the delay messages. There's no plane, which is obviously what we need to go on holiday with, but I'm still suspending my disbelief when they say the delay will be 45 minutes. And I said to my very disappointed small children very early in the day, don't worry, kids, we're still going on holiday we're just going to be a bit delayed. There's uh, still no plane after an hour. And then I was told to move to gate 52. And my mood brightened because I thought that maybe there was a plane at gate 52 that would take us on holiday. But actually, there wasn't a plane at gate 52. Gate 52 had a special door that led you to the baggage reclaim area. <laughs> so I appeared suddenly ejected into a large hallway to reclaim my baggage. Not such a good Christian traveller anymore. What do you mean our plane isn't going? What do you mean our plane is cancelled? So I picked up our baggage and I wheeled out through customs. Then I had to go to passport control. No, I haven't been on holiday. No, I haven't even left the country. Why am I here? Why are you looking at me? Then I go out to the long stay car park. Yes, it's an irony. No, it wasn't a long stay was very short. I went in here at half past four this morning. I'm now leaving here at half past nine this morning. I have not been anywhere on holiday. It had all the hallmarks of the return from a happy holiday. This wasn't happy and it wasn't a holiday. But I tried to console my two small children not to worry because daddy had rebooked the flight for the next day. We were going to come back for the same flight tomorrow, and we were going to go on holiday. You see, the trouble with doubt is not that doubt exists, but that doubt strengthens and grows in the face of our disappointments. What can be helpful as a prompt to choose belief can become a weight that drags us down. Doubt isn't the problem. The problem is that doubt grows and overwhelms us. My daughter said to me, Daddy, what if the plane tomorrow is cancelled? That is preposterous, I said to her. No airline, even a budget airline, would think about cancelling the same flight the next day. You honestly have nothing to worry about. You know, Thomas, he didn't lack courage. Thomas was one of the greatest missionaries of the church. Indeed, he ultimately was martyred for his faith. He died for his faith in Chennai in India. But like many people, Thomas appeared to have struggled to hold on to hope. Doubt become not a good adjunct to faith, but something that overwhelmed him. And it seemed that Thomas prepared himself for bad things by constantly telling himself that bad things were going to happen. In John eleven sixteen, 16, facing the possibility that Jesus may be stoned in Judea, he says, let's go also so that we can die. He anticipates the worst to protect himself. There aren't any silver linings where Thomas was concerned, even early on. You see, doubt can become a defense mechanism that insulates our hearts from the pain of being let down. Have you met someone who constantly pulls out the worst case scenario, who constantly refers to the catastrophe that's waiting for them. Because actually, if you just mention the catastrophe all the time, then things might be a bit better. They'll always be just a bit better than the catastrophe, but they're still always pretty terrible. Doubt kills far more dreams than failure ever will, because doubt steals our opportunities. It keeps us small. And out of what we call doubt can emerge the two great enemies of faith, which are skepticism, which demands absolute evidence for belief, and cynicism, which is an underlying distrust of all things. And so 
doubt which can be helpful and positive can morph into doubtfulness, which is skepticism and cynicism. Leslie Newbegin, the great bishop and writer, says, if one doubts everything, one learns nothing. Thomas doesn't appear to have moved into cynicism, but when he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails are and put my hand into his side, I will not believe, he certainly seems to have become a skeptic. His skepticism, you see, is rooted in his disappointment that the person he dedicated his life to, the person who he believed wholeheartedly to be the Messiah of the world, lay dead in a tomb. Thomas is saying, I'm not going to risk it again. I'm not going to risk that heartache again. I'm going I'm I'm to allow myself to entertain hope again. Why would I believe this and be disappointed a second time? So, the second day. It's like Groundhog Day. I get my kids up again at 4 a.m. I put them in the car seats. We get in the car and we drive to the airport. Apart from this time, there's no storm. It's a sunny day. There's hardly any wind. But my daughter can't fall back to sleep again because she's terribly anxious that the plane isn't going to fly a second time. Uh, We arrive at the check-in. And I say to the guy, you know, we were on the flight yesterday. You know, the one that was cancelled. That was very painful but I'm back and I'm going to give you another chance today. He's like, don't worry, sir, your flight is fine. We put our baggage in, we go to passport control, we go through into the lounge, we have another ridiculously expensive breakfast that tastes not very nice and uh, we try and kill time around the shops before we go to the gate. My children uh, go to the toilet and my daughter keeps saying to me, Dad, is it all okay? Is it all all right? You know, are we going to go on holiday today? Now, there's something about the environment in Gatwick uh, Terminal North that is slightly depressed. Uh, I can see a number of families uh, like ours who were on the flight yesterday who also look anxious. There seems to be too many people in the terminal for the size of the terminal. There's lots of works going on there, so it's kind of noisy and generally unpleasant. Uh, I felt slightly aggrieved yesterday because my kids had also lost my Kindle reader with all my holiday books on uh, in the terminal and I kind of wandered around hoping that I might find it, which of course I I didn't. And and the children went off to the toilet one last time before we went to the gate and just in a moment of anxiety I pressed refresh on the app on my phone that tells me whether the flight is actually going or not and an orange writing came up at that point that said, flight cancelled. I looked at it and my heart kind of leapt into my mouth and I, and I went to the information desk for this budget airline and I said to the lady, uh, I was on the flight that was cancelled yesterday. And she said, oh yes sir. I, I said, I just wondered if the flight was going today. She said, oh yes, of course. I said, just wonder if you could explain this. She took a look at it and laughed nervously and said, that's ridiculous. And I said, would you mind calling? And then she was on her headset and then she looked very sad and went, It's cancelled. I'm so sorry. Disbelieving. I moved slowly back to my family as they returned from the toilet. And it's hard to describe the conversation that I had with my daughter. Between tears and rage and disbelief, I try to explain that despite things going wrong for a second time, on a second day, They would not always go wrong. We trudged wearily back to the luggage hall where I reclaimed my luggage, trying still to be a Christian traveller. I took them back gruffly off the counter and I moved through customs where I scoffed at the idea that I might have bought something abroad that I might then bring back to the UK that I haven't left for two days. And then I go through passport control again looking for the man who'd seen me the day before so I could sort of welcome myself back to the UK despite the fact that I have not left again. Then I go out to the long-term car park and say, hello, here I am. I've returned from my long journey to the terminal and now I'm back to collect my car after a very short stay. And we drove away. Well, 
Because doubt is a necessary part and a healthy part of our spiritual lives, it has to be held in tension with hope. You see, skepticism and cynicism are bought, born in doubtfulness. And being to the brim full with doubt leaves no room for hope and no room for peace. I find it fascinating that Jesus says when he miraculously comes into the room and stands by Thomas in verse 26, peace be with you. Because you see, skeptics and cynics may be insulated from future disappointment, but they're also insulated from peace. They may be able to say, I told you so, when things go badly, but they can never feel real joy when it doesn't. Jeff Bridges wrote, most cynics are really crushed romantics. They've been hurt, they're sensitive, and their cynicism is a shell that's protecting this tiny dear part in them that's still alive. You know, Thomas stands like a cup full of doubt next to Jesus. But Jesus drains the glass with three proofs that the skeptics demanded. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Now I'm going to refill you with something good. I'm going to fill you up with peace. I'm going to fill you up with hope. I'm going to renew your joy. And so this little piece of me was set on fire by my daughter's massive disappointment because I could see skepticism in her. I could see this cynicism growing in her. I could see her saying, we are never going to go, are we? It's just another adult letdown. This is all a game, isn't it? We come to the airport going on holiday. We're not really going, are we, Daddy? And so I decided to speak to a reputable British airline company in the airport terminal. And I said, have you got any flights to the mountains that leaves today? The lady said, yes, I've got four flights that leave from Heathrow Airport. I said, excellent, I'd like to buy them, please. She said, yes, this is how much they cost. (laughs) I swallowed hard, and even though I couldn't afford them, I decided that I would buy them. Uh, This is what a seven- and five-year-old look like when they've been in an airport terminal twice in 24 hours. This is them actually just eating the sugar directly from the sugar (laughs) packets on the table. It's not a good parenting tip. And I said to my kids, I said, don't worry kids, daddy's bought another flight. We are going on holiday. But in the gap between moving between Gatwick and Heathrow, my daughter said, daddy, do you think the third flight might be cancelled too? And I answered cautiously. I said, darling, it could be cancelled. But if it was cancelled, it wouldn't mean that good things don't happen. Is it hard to hope when you feel let down? Yes, she said, but I feel a bit better. When we drop our defensiveness and allow our skepticism and our cynicism to thaw out, that's when we begin to see change. But it has to come from us. You see, despite being present, despite him offering Thomas the opportunity to touch his wounds, Thomas still had to choose to believe that Jesus was alive. We have to choose to believe over our skepticism and our cynicism. We have to choose to believe over our doubtfulness. Here's a little clip uh, I saw uh, from a CCTV camera inside a shop. There's no sound.
In verse 27, Jesus says, stop doubting and believe. You've just seen it with your eyes, but do you really believe it? It's hard, but it's our decision. We live in the natural, but we're children of the supernatural. And Thomas freely proclaims, my Lord and my God, I choose to believe. I choose to believe. You know, Heathrow is great, Terminal 5. It's an environment that's filled with faith. You know, it's a spacious place. And when I was in Terminal 5, I could feel my spirits lift. And not only that, but after about half an hour of wandering around the very nice shops, I got a phone call, having been in Dixon's, there are other brands, to replace my Kindle reader. I got a phone call from Gatwick to tell me that they found my Kindle. I even went back into that said electrical store and gave them back the one that I just bought to say, don't worry, they found the thing that was lost. And we went to the gate, smiling broadly at everyone. Uh, airline stewardesses and stewards have never been so complimented as they were by my five and seven year old. Hello, do you work for the reputable British airline? <laughs> You're amazing. We love you. You're brilliant. This is what it looks like to be in the air after 36 hours in two London airports. <laughs> Cynicism undone. You know, our lives are filled with disappointments, far more grave and painful than our little holiday delay. But perhaps it's a good illustration of just how quickly doubt can take over. If cynicism and skepticism can take root in the most hopeful little people, in the most practical of circumstances, how much more can cynicism and skepticism take root in our lives in the face of relationship breakdowns or financial difficulties or political scandals or church disappointments? And you know, today I believe that Jesus is calling us out of the fear and self-preservation of doubtfulness into a place of vulnerability where belief is available again to us. We might not get what we want or the proof that we seek, but we have the presence and the peace of Jesus Christ with us and hope in areas of our lives that have become dry and hard. Let's not doubt in the night what God has shown us in the day. Let's allow our hearts to be soft again to his promise and to his presence. I'm Bear Grylls. My favourite way to start the day, the Bible in one year. That's how wild I am. Find out more at BibleInOneYear.org or download the Bible in One Year app.